I said, look, I'm not a battery engineer and I'm not going to try to be one, right? Because I, I can't go toe to toe with you in that field in the same way that you might not be able to go to toe to toe to toe with me in my field, but I'm here to help you out. And I think we all know what help looks like, right? And so I think that helped me overcome that imposter syndrome very early on. All right, you ready to jump into it? Cool. Greetings, lifers, and thanks for joining us. You're listening to Lifetime Value, the customer success podcast, where we help you wrap up the week that was in customer success and start you off on the right foot for the one ahead of you. I am your host, the Energizer Bunny, or for our European friends, the Duracell Bunny of customer success podcasts. My name is Dylan Young, and this week's guest is the head of customer success at Voltaic a battery intelligence software platform. His perspective on the customer success motion is refreshing to say the least. And his background is incredible, has a lot to do with that perspective. I'm looking forward to hearing him tell us about it. Ladies and gentlemen, we have Jay Goy with us today. Jay, thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dennis, for having me. Appreciate it. <laughs> uh, it is Goy, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Your boy is a Goy. Your boy, the goy. I like that. Jay, so tell us a little bit about yourself. How did you come to be here today? I'm an Army vet, uh, tons of government experience. I started off very young, basic training, Fort Jackson, relaxing Jackson. Circa, <laughs> I'm not going to tell you, but uh, I started off in comms. I was in satellite communications. Uh, they stuck me in an infantry unit, so I was carried around a radio for a while, uh, but really running and gunning with a lot of uh, infantry guys. Uh, that I'm still close with today. Uh, I said, hmm, tired of rocking. Let me get a, a little chip on my shoulder. So I switched to uh, Intel. And so I did a lot of human intelligence, open source intelligence for some time. And then uh, after that, I transitioned into federal, state, and local government work. Uh, did a stint with uh, an agency where I was working with the DEA, and then I was tasked on doing a lot of cool things with the DEA, running and gunning all over the country. And then I said, all right, you know, let, let me settle down. Uh, it's nice being at home a bit more, and it's nice not living life, having an interesting perspective on everyone you engage with. And so I said, mm -hmm. let me see what's out there. Uh, I was in grad school with a guy that was very well-known in the automotive industry and in the SaaS industry. And uh, I reached out to him and it was interesting because when we were in grad school, I connected with him and I said, let's stay connected. Our walks of life have nothing to do with each other, but you seem like an interesting person. And so he said, you're interested in pivoting? And I was like, yeah. And so he said, let me introduce you to a few folks, but the rest is on you. I'm just going to introduce you and let them know that you had some interesting conversation and then it's up to you to sell yourself. So I ended up at this thing called the uh, custom. Well, I was a customer program manager at first, and then you know, in, in small startup world, think your your uh, role and your title changes every week. And so then eventually, I landed on this thing called customer success, and it was interesting because my whole life I've been helping customers succeed. Except the difference was a lot of my other customers were policy officials, and intelligence uh, intelligence supervisors. Attorneys, DAs, USAs, mm -hmm. uh, so U.S. District Attorneys, U.S. Attorneys, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's how I ended up here. I think you're alluding to it a bit in everything you've done has been about making customers successful. Is that what excites you about customer success? Is it the, the serving of others or is it another aspect that gets you going? So there's a few things. Uh, I like succeeding with people next to me, right? So if we are all on the same ship, and really we all are, even our customers, right? Uh, because their success is our success in many ways. I think the one of the big things I like doing is solving problems. I like 
helping, especially in my industry, because it's overly complex. I'm talking 90% of maybe more than that, a solid 95% of my customer base are PhDs, um, mostly electrochemists or battery engineers. And so the, their problems are highly complex. So I love being able to navigate in this field and really help. It, it puts a smile on my face when I know that I've helped them out. The one thing that really made me transition over is I wanted my engagement to be different, where every time I engage with someone, they're not trying to, to deceive me or hurt me in, in one way, shape or form. So it's refreshing to to know that people just want their jobs to be easier. And I'm here to do that in one way, shape or form. And so you found customer success through a colleague at your or a, a fellow student in your grad school program introduced you to a couple of folks. You ended up at Voltaic where you were a customer program manager for LinkedIn tells me about two months mm -hmm. before you became their head of customer success. And so it's been relatively, it's been a, a short amount of time, but I, you don't sound like a novice. You sound like you've, you've got it figured out. And I think it goes back to what you said around, you just had to reframe some of the th same things you've been doing for other folks now doing it in more of a direct customer vendor, even though I hate that word relationship. And so you are now, I would say you brand yourself as a customer success professional. Why do you stick around in this profession over, you know, a guy of, of your background, you could probably go and do just about anything, right? Maybe not anything, but why do you stick around customer success now? Well, it's fun. Um, at least for me, it's fun. Uh, I know it sounds really weird uh, because my previous life was really, it, it was significantly full of adrenaline, right? And I'm doing all this really crazy activity involved and doing these high risk projects and really traveling all over the world, doing some dangerous things with some dangerous people. And so to land here, people are like, wait, what? How? And, you know, I even speak to my colleagues in the past and they're like, you sure you like sitting behind a computer? Is that all? like, is that cool? Mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, I mean, I sit behind a computer, but I get to see what folks are doing and be part of the process. Right. And I trust the process. So we have some automotive folks and I get to understand what it is that they're doing and how they're getting these vehicles on the road. Uh, got a lot of other consumer electronics folks. So it's it's part of a bigger project and at the same time you're doing something good right for and you know there's this whole wave where you're doing something good for the community and giving back in one way shape or form right but i'm doing something that's helping people in different ways right and so i i i like the challenges that it that it brings i re recall changing over and saying i'm about to deal with a whole bunch of phds uh and so this is going to be really fun uh because you know one thing that i always i always notice is that the higher the intellect when it comes to an academic education, and by that I mean more like a scholarly ed education, the lower mm -hmm. your emotional intelligence is, right? And so I, I come from a place where it's like high emotional intelligence, and then I kind of leverage and uh, increase my scholar, <laughs> I guess my, my scholar repertoire so that I can be at that kind of even ground. So it's interesting engaging with people um, that are very different from my walks of life. Do you struggle with, I don't mean this in any particular way, but when I'm you're not. dealing with folks that are really, really smart, have dedicated their lives to something like a PhD, and then that's a very, that's usually a very specific line of research that you get that PhD within. So for these guys, it's, it's uh, chemical engineering, usually sometimes electrical engineering. They're all dealing with battery science, basically. You're a... You, you did some interesting stuff in the military, but you're a, you're a, what do they call them? Jarhead, right? Well, <laughs> and I use that in the nicest possible way, right? But like you came from that particular world. Yeah. Do you ever feel any sort of imposter syndrome dealing with the, the folks well, that you deal with on a daily basis now? So I, I'd be lying if I said, if I said no, you know, I come from a, an impoverished background of really, a really interesting background, right? Uh, and so when I first started, I I got to my position in two interesting ways. A, there was a huge organizational shift um, and they had seen my work ethic over a short period and said, we're going to trust this person and just 
help him out wherever he needs to help. And so I had someone that I work with very closely. I'm not going to say her name because I didn't ask her before. And so she was also a peer, but she was a battery engineer. And so I would confide in her early on and say, I feel like, you know, I'm dealing with, how am I going to pick this up? This is a, it's a different path, right? It's a completely different ball game. And Mm -hmm. how can I serve folks who are, who are really embedded in this? And I said, you know what? I'm not here to be the subject matter expert at the solutions we provide. I'm here to understand how that solution provides value to customers and how to keep providing that value. And I I, I will lie to you if I did not say that a large part of helping me overcome that were conversations with this person. Uh, mm-hmm. She was a huge anchor for me when I first started. And there was a lot of you know, I was very transparent and I, and I come and I wasn't only transparent with her, but I was transparent with my customers. And I said, look, I'm not a battery engineer and I'm not going to try to be one, right? Because I, I can't go toe to toe with you in that field in the same way that you might not be able to go to toe to toe to toe with me in my field, but I'm here to help you out. And I think we all know what help looks like, right? And so I think that helped me overcome that imposter syndrome very early on. I love what you said that one of those last points of uh, we all know what help looks like. I think we all know what authenticity looks like. I think those kind of go hand in hand, right? Like at a certain point, you've got to have a, a level of capability to help them. Right? You can't just be a helpful dope, but yeah. <laughs> you also don't have to be necessarily on their level if if the job doesn't require that. If you delivering your software and your service to them does not require you to also understand, you know, the way the the intricacies of batteries, then that's almost a waste of time, right? To understand that stuff. Not necessarily, right? It, it always is helpful to be able to talk the talk. But uh, the I love that saying of we all know what help looks like, because I think that authenticity drops uh, a lot of guards. And it asks for those people to lean in and kind of meet you halfway to help them get their job done and help you get your job done. hundred percent. Jay, do you want to jump into a couple of the current event topics of this week? Sure. Let's do it. So the first one I want to cover here, Jay, is actually this conversation that's been happening a lot. Basically, where does customer success end and where does support end? begin. This is almost a continuation of my conversation with Rob Zambito last week. He wholeheartedly believes that customer success should own support. A CSM should be able to deliver support to a customer. No surprise that I don't agree with that. But I think that that my, my stance is not correct either. I think it totally spans the spectrum. I think it depends on the maturity of the organization. It depends on the uh, product that you're selling and a ton of other variables that might come into play. But I want to ask you how, as the head of customer success at Voltaic, how you guys handle that, particularly with such a technical product. I think you mentioned something very valuable, Dylan, and I think that the, the answer to that is it depends across the board, period. And that's really the answer to a lot of customer success questions, because what mm-hmm. works in one space does not work in another. And that applies to almost every walk of life. Now, that being said, uh, we, we touch base on the fact that it's a highly technical product. And so although we can't particularly fully take on that support function, we are still delivering support. So my team, the team and the managers under me, uh, or the, I don't like the term under, so the, the managers that are my colleagues, let's call it that, right, mm-hmm. that I'm responsible for, we triage. So we are that first level of support. So we understand the problem, and then we say, okay, is this a learning opportunity? Is this a fix that we're capable of? Or is this now something that must be escalated to engineers? And so for me and my team, right, we have folks that can deliver that science support, 
early on because in, in an essence, we're the first enterprise battery intelligence company. So many times customers come to us to understand what folks are doing in the industry. So for us, support is definitely part of customer success, but customer success doesn't entirely own support. It's an interaction of, of really resources, right? Uh, so we do take that first line of triage and then we really uh, escalate it as needed. And so you mentioned engineers. Are your support folks battery engineers? Do they have the same kind of PhD level education as, as the folks that you're dealing with on a regular basis? So that is a great question. Uh, I will say that I work hand in hand with the battery engineers and we all fall under the larger umbrella. But the folks who I'm responsible for are not battery engineers. They are, however, technically proficient in mm. the battery and science field. Mm. And then I have, mm. as I expressed before, um, the person that I would confide in very early on, and she's my equal. And so she is a battery engineer. And then I have other battery engineers that I work hand in hand. So essentially we see the problem, we go, okay, is this a learning opportunity? Is this an issue with code or is this an actual battery engineer related matter? And at that point we escalate it. Yeah, and I guess your product is interesting in that way of there's multiple layers of technical difficulty to it because yeah. the software is interpreting the performance of batteries as I understand your what your product does, correct? Yeah, so you have, you've got a ton of different battery cyclers, uh, also mm -hmm. known as testers, and they all output different formats. We now take all of those formats and we harmonize them so they're in a unified format so that you can compare and analyze rather quickly. So you're dealing with all of these different types of formats that are consistently changing. Yeah. And you can imagine that once one uh, company updates their software and all of a sudden where something once was, it no longer is. And either our product is flexible enough to understand that or the change has been robust enough to the point where we have to make adjustments. So we have to kind of analyze where that problem exists. And I think that as we go through the support function or the problem function, mm -hmm. we yeah. might touch multiple layers. So it depends. And the more complex the problem is, the further out that layer stretches. And just to clarify, Voltaic is, is relatively small, right? You guys are about, is it how many employees? Uh, so I'd say we're like 40 something employees. Do you anticipate as you guys grow that the detail with which your CSMs troubleshoot directly with your customers will change? Or do you think that's a feature that you'll want to maintain? I do not think that it will change. Mm. And that might be a bit, I might be jumping the gun a little bit there, but <laughs> the reason why I don't think that it will change is because no one wants to troubleshoot science on a call, mm. right? Mm. And so when you think about it, right, when you get a problem, when you're in school and you get a problem, you sit there for time and you analyze and you find the root of that problem. And that's not something that is done immediately, right? Now, I can say that you have a, technology is advancing at a robust rate that perhaps in you know a few years, there'll be some machine learning algorithm that'll be able to quickly assess a problem and then things might change on, on you know, in, in that sense. You might ask chat GPT, tell me what's the problem with this file and yeah. then you can do it yeah. all. But it, for the most part, you have... The, we do the quick triage session, like as I'm mm -hmm. talking to someone and I have one of my technical partners or one of the customer success managers are talking to someone, the other technical person is already troubleshooting. And if it's something quick, we could deliver that value there. If not, it, we got to take it off the call. What I think is really interesting, and I hope that folks are picking up on, is how outside of the norm what Jay's description is from, from what most folks understand to be the support motion, right? It is, it is so much more complicated and in depth when you're dealing with, you know, it's not, Oh, my email didn't fire off to my customer. Yeah. I'm, I'm saying the customer has a, a third party customer, right? Um, 
it's it's much more complicated and requires and demands a completely different model for support that I think only enforces reinforces what we said at the beginning of this, which is it totally depends. And Voltaic is a fantastic example of doesn't fit the standard model for how support and ticketing works in a lot of SaaS businesses. I think that's really valuable, valuable for you to share. And so you mentioned this a little bit about how your folks are really good at triaging and understanding maybe impact and urgency within a call and how to prioritize that over maybe other things that you were you were planning to talk about in a call. And so then how do you, how have you systematized that for your colleagues, the folks that you're responsible for? How do you empower them to drive that conversation and to say to their customers, hey, bring your issues to me. I'll be your first line of defense, but also know when to bow out and say, okay, I got to give this to somebody else, right? Maybe it's too in the weeds. It's too technical for them. How do you empower them to have that conversation with a customer, particularly a PhD level sort of person who thinks like, oh, you don't know how to handle this? I'm being hyperbolic, but how do you empower your folks to have that sort of conversation? I totally get what you mean, Dylan. And my way I view it is if it starts right, it ends right. And if you don't know something, have no problem saying, I don't know, let me get the right folks or let me get with the right folks to find the answer for you. And I'm a big supporter of that, right? And I tell all my managers and all my employees, hey, we just got to be honest. We got to be honest <laughs> in the beginning. Like, it, it, I'm not going to try to figure it out if I have no idea where to start. And, and that's what it is. And then there's another layer here. We still have other, like we have a support email. I say, hey, shoot support. Or I'll say after the call, please shoot support an email. So we have that documented and the right party gets to it, you know. And so we, we track every account. We have systems in place to track all of the problems that everyone's going yeah. through. And we have yeah. prioritization yeah. meetings, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So many other things like other organizations, right, within the same space of this uniqueness that we have. Yeah, that's interesting. And and I think what starts right, ends right is is the right way to put it. So often we end up zooming out to these kind of like first level principles of uh, honesty, transparency, uh, proactivity, and it's less about, oh, if, well, if I send this email at exactly this time, then I get the best response rate and that's what's going to turn into a renewal, right? Like all that stuff is, is uh, up to interpretation in my mind, and it truly is about the way you conduct your business at that almost at the at the principle and the value level and if you do that correctly then a lot of the other things fall into place just say you agree oh <laughs> i nodded my head there for those who did not see me <laughs> for those on the audio version jay I want to jump into another segment of the show, and that is the segment we refer to as BS in CS. Biggest load of crap I've ever heard. Number one bullshit. Oh, number one bullshit. Jay, if you could choose one, what is the trend, catchphrase, or otherwise related to customer success that you would like to see done away with forever? There is a secret sauce to calculate churn. <laughs> and hmm. that that is actually, how would I say? There are many ways where that is said, right? But if you do X and Y, you're going to avoid churn. If you do Y and R, you're hmm. going to avoid churn. Okay. It's like I was reading your mind. <laughs> and so it's it's funny because I always say, like, I've been in this space. And so I've learned a lot about machine learning and modeling and how uh, that really speeds time to manufacture batteries and many other things in, uh, out there in consumer electronics and uh, the automotive industry. But one of the things that I think about is that machine learning and modeling is, is very much like that secret sauce right and it's going to depend on where you are it's going to depend on what your objectives are 
Mm. It's going to depend on your organization, right? Every organization is going to be different. And essentially, you have to look at your metrics and find what metrics best match churn. And then you have to now take the churn that occurs and compare it to that baseline that it is that you develop. And you can develop that manually, right? You can have a an in-house person uh, come in and de- develop a software that ingests that, or there's tons of CS secret programs out there where you input and it outputs information for you. And so what you must do is you must build your own model and you must train against your own model and understand that as you escalate and as you elevate within your organization, that model will change and you cannot compare where you are to an older model. You have to adjust your model as well. And so that is my approach on churn. Uh, and that's one of the BS and CS that I see all the time. Everybody, I even see it in marketing. Like I went to a conference and folks are like, we can help you limit churn. We can help you avoid churn. And we can, how can you help me avoid churn, right? When you don't know anything yet, right? So how's about, let's talk, let's talk about what, what you think you would do to help me, you know, avoid churn. And I'm like, well, that might not apply for me, right? And so it's interesting, but I think that that's a big one. No number is really going to tell you. You really want to know who's going to churn? And someone said this. I can't recall your, her name, but I apologize for uh, not mentioning your name here. But she said it uh, during a conference. And she said, you want to know what churn looks like? Talk to your CSM because they're going to know who's going to churn. I do think the best way to determine the leading indicators for churn are in researching customers that previously churned. But what I thought was super interesting about what you said and what I think a lot of people miss is that it's got to be based off of data that you collect based off of goals you're trying to achieve and that it will continue to change and it will continue to change for a number of different reasons. The first one is because the reasons as your product evolves, so are the reasons for churn. They will evolve. But I think the other one is what I think a a lot of folks miss is how critical it is to continue to measure your data in the same way. Because if you take a cohort and you create a benchmark for leading indicators for churn, and then you change a bunch of shit, including your product, including the cadence at which you communicate to your customers, including the way in which you communicate ROI and all of those things, some of that is going to have a positive impact. Some of it's going to have a negative impact. And if you are not measuring all of those changes as they occur, first of all, you have no way of, of measuring how it is you impacted how you positively or negatively impacted your churn, but then you lose complete sight of what your benchmark was. I agree. It's a scientific process. You got to know where you control variables are. (laughs) 100%. You're right. And you bring up an interesting point, attesting to the, almost the uniqueness of, uh, of my, my role in in the space that I'm in. My, so we have different types of segments, the research and development folks, are doing tons of different types of testing. So it requires the most support. They're also the smallest income accounts, which is really interesting Mm -hmm. because the highest income accounts require support, but it's a different level of support. It's a technical support to ensure streamlined pipeline, right? Yep. And so it's just interesting because what you use, and to to circle it back to your statement, uh, what you use for a research and development uh, company may not particularly apply. That same mode and method of attack isn't going to apply for your enterprise customers. You know, you might sink your ship. Of course, there are certain common denominators, right? But the overarching equation isn't going to be exactly the same. Well, it's like a... uh a standard aphorism to say that managing a small customer versus managing a big customer, like the big customer is not proportionately more difficult to manage. The value is outsized compared to the, the post sales effort in a lot of cases, not always. I think also completely unrelated, right? You and I have completely different business models that we work within. Mm-hmm. I have customers, some of my biggest customers, software customers, 
have dedicated support teams internally that a portion of what they do is support my software. And so they, they, I, I get less tickets from them proportionally than I do from my smaller guys because they're just more sophisticated in the way they, they support their folks. And it, it, it's probably similar to what you said, right? They're protecting uh, a much larger revenue stream and our, our software sits in the middle of a very big and significant revenue stream. And so they put a lot more in place to protect it. In doing so, they understand our software much better, the ins and outs of it than some of our smaller guys. All right, Jay, on to our next segment. This is the segment where we give you an opportunity, even if it's pretend, to fire one of your customers, past or present. This is the segment we refer to as churn it up. And so tell us about that customer that you wish you could uh, divorce, Jay. <laughs> so you ever had, and my wife will kill me for saying this, so I'm not going to say it. <laughs> that's, always, that's always the best way to start a sentence. And yet, no, but and yet I, we still talk as men. We still talk, don't we? <laughs> no, I'm not going to say it, but I'll say this. I, I had a customer who I was giving, when I first assessed the account, I had a meeting and I said, look, I gave him the spiel from earlier on. I said, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to keep it funky with you. I need you to be 100% honest with me. And then that's really the baseline and we're going to succeed. And so I essentially had, and what someone called later was an hour reaming session from the customer. And they weren't screaming at me and they weren't screaming at all. I, I've i never been screamed at by a customer, mm. but they were in Lucky such a you. bad... <laughs> 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 they, they were in such a bad space. I think, and... You said lucky you. I think that if someone screamed at me, someone else might jump on the call and be like, there is no reason you should scream here because he's done nothing to scream at you, right? Or to get you to scream at him. Mm -hmm. I try to hit folks at a really mellow, like super chill vibe. Mm -hmm. But fast forward. And so things were just horrible. And so I started ringing the bells and I started doing everything that I could. And it was just, I was underwater for a while making sure that this account was in, in a better place. And so then we got to a space where there was something that they wanted to do. And I told them, I said, look, remember I said, I'm going to be honest with you. I said, look at the list of stuff that we have to do. Look at the list of things that are pending for you right now. I don't think it's best for us to promise that we're going to take that on. Like, I know that you're willing to pay for it and whatever the case may be. But it's it's not best interest. I can't promise you that we're going to have a streamlined project here, given our already robust workload. And mm -hmm. so the customer tells me, and this is hilarious to me, at least. He said, I'm sorry, Jay. I respectfully decline your rejection. I'll pay whatever it is it cost. I was like, <laughs> wait, what? So this guy sounds interesting, this man or woman sounds interesting. Mm -hmm. This sounds, feels, smells like the classic customer misunderstanding the level of effort to do something that they're requesting. Am I comprehending your story correctly? So I will say this. These are incredibly competent people. And they are probably the top tier people in in the world that we're talking about, right? In in this space, and they all know each other. Was it Elon Musk? I, this seems no, like I'm not going to get Elon into, Musk would say. I'm not going to get into who or what it was, but I laughed, and you know, I had never been told no in that way. So it was it was interesting, and it was just it was. An interesting experience, you know. Um, there were a lot of long days, a lot of long nights, a lot of fires late late night Fridays, and so although it was like, oh, God, I can't wait till this gets cleared off my plate, I couldn't get them to. 
I couldn't wait to get them to get better place and embrace the challenge in that same light. And more recently, um, they they were the customer I said had a really good compliment on the team. And I was like, you guys should be really happy because we all know where we were quite some time ago. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I can always go back to the, I, I, I will say this, I, I do struggle with, because again, I, I'm, I'm a person that really makes decisions based off of morals as opposed to I understand business plans. I understand strategy. I understand objectives, yeah. right? But I'm going to do what's right no matter what it is, right? And so we're going to have this agreement if I know something is right. And I know that if my job is to provide you success, right, by definition, there are going to be instances where I might have to do a little bit more for a customer who isn't necessarily as strategically valuable, right? And so sometimes I do struggle with that. I'd be lying if I didn't, right, because we're dealing with people. What I think is interesting, though, about what you said is I, too believe in the morality of what we do. I think that that needs to be prioritized. But I think what gets lost, that doesn't mean you give your stuff away for free, right? It doesn't mean that you convince your product team to build something that won't be useful to anybody else. I think where morality and good economics intersect is the sweet spot. And I think that's what a lot of CSMs miss. I don't know. I don't want to say that about it. I don't want to throw a blanket out there on everybody. But I think it's also what customers miss. And it's a a conversation I have a lot with customers of like, the economics just don't make sense for us to do that ridiculous thing you're asking us to do. Right? Paraphrasing, you say it a lot nicer to the customer. But it's so it's funny because I do say that to customers. I say the amount of work that it's going to cost us to do is going to interfere with everyone else. And then we'll have everyone on a bad chip and then we'll try to juggle all of that while juggling all of the things that you need. And then we'll end up in a hot mess. And so I'm not afraid of saying no. It's just about how I deliver that no. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And, And so I'll tell folks, look, I tell them straight up, look, let me take it back to the product team. I'll see what our current plans are. I'll see if it's something that makes sense. And if it makes sense. We'll implement it. I can't promise you when we're going to implement it at this time, but if it's on our roadmap, I'll let you know. Uh, And then I'll bring back that feedback. And I think we're at a place now where customers understand that, right? And I can attest to before, and I won't talk on what things were before because I don't want to speak about some of the peers in the past who have passed the torch. Uh, Mm -hmm. But I will say that it's all about setting the right expectations and and understanding and being honest with folks. I I don't mean to be the dead horse there, right? But if you're honest with folks there, they can be understanding. Of course, depending on your space, you're going to have folks who are not, but. I think deep down, they understand. I think even some of my toughest customers of which I've dealt with very recently, Mm -hmm. I think they understand, but are in a lot of cases, they're fighting for their life, right? They're fighting for their job. They're fighting for their ego. They're fighting for a lot of stuff, but they know, they know. Yeah. (laughs) You know, (laughs) and you're not lying. I think as long as you can be confident that you're doing what's right for the most people, then you just, you sleep well at night. Very true. Big facts, as we would like to say. Big facts. (laughs) Jay, I want to wrap it up. Uh, and the way we we start the wrap up is with the CS player of the week. So who out there is moving the customer success profession forward in the past seven days for you? Who do you want to give a shout out to? Uh, I'll say Jason Lemkin. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. I do. He's a bit of an arch enemy for me. Uh, yeah. I understand he's a smart and intelligent man, but... Um, I will say no more. Why do you like Jason? I never said I liked him. I just. <laughs> <laughs> They're two different things. All right. Tell but me I about will Jason. <laughs> I, 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 look, I will say this. I will say this. I'll, I'll keep it. I'll keep it a buck. As I tell my customers, right? I'll keep it a hundred with you. Uh, I transitioned into this field completely. I didn't know. CS. I knew people, but CS has its own nuances mm-hmm. and structures and things. And they apply their, like, you can figure them out. You can figure them out fairly quickly. And so one of the things that my CEO gave me feedback on one time, he was just like, get to know a little bit more about CS. 
And so he used to always send me these articles uh, mm -hmm. from this person. And this was the only person I knew that was doing CS work. So I followed him on LinkedIn. And so every so often, I'll just dive in and I'll look at one of his webinars or things of that sort. I can't say that I like the person because I know I'm not, nor do I follow him heavily. But I can't say this. There are instances where he does say some things that make sense and yeah. some things that are yeah. insightful. And so you got to give credit where credit is due. Well, a broke clock is is right twice a day, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's where we're going here. <laughs> I don't listen to him twice a day, so I can't tell you. <laughs> no, I don't have. I don't. I have no allegiances one way or the other. Mm -hmm. Jay, referrals and recommendations. If you could take the audience members and point them in the direction of any one thing or activity, and it does not have to be customer success related, what would it be? So I struggled with this, man. I struggled with this because my thing is books. And so a lot of the time I read so many books that had to do, well, I'm a big, I like self-help books, but ones that make sense, not ones that are like, you're going to sit in Zen for 18 minutes and then you're going to be great for the rest of your life. Okay. Let me ask you this. <laughs> in what category make sense or not make sense is the secret as a self-help book? <laughs> I think, well, that's I, a good question. I'm just, I'm just trying to define, I'm trying to set some guardrails for the listeners here over what you consider sensical so there, and nonsensical. Okay, so I'm reading this book and I won't talk about the author or anything, right? And the guy's like, meditate as long as you can, as much as you can, and it's going to help you out. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, okay, that works for certain people. Right. But I feel I'm very functional with my workflow. Right. And so I think that balance is the big one for folks. Right. And not just, again, going back to that secret sauce, there's no secret sauce of life. Mm -hmm. It's just about having the right balance, really. Right. Doing Ikigai, if you're familiar with the term, it's something I keep up there somewhere, Ikigai. And it's it's really about, it's I-K-I-G-A-I -I, for the folks who don't know it. But take a look at that, right? And it's really about finding this really su sweet spot, as you said earlier, Dylan, mm -hmm. and finding what you love with what you can make money off of and a whole bunch of different factors, the interaction of factors. But it is a sweet spot to life, right? And so I feel that places that tell you things that make sense, right? But also things mm -hmm. that you can balance mm -hmm. with. Okay, cool. Makes sense. But that's like, yeah, so you're going to look beneath. Go ahead. What's your book? Because I, I, I have a, a response here, but I want to hear your book first. So the book that I mentioned for this specific thing uh, was Getting to Yes. I do like that book because with yeah. everything in life, you yeah. negotiate. Yeah. With everything in life. Everything in life is a negotiation. Mm -hmm. there, there were a few other books I had, but you said one, so I'm going to keep it there. Well, thank you for following the rules. Nobody ever does. So um, bonus points to you. I spoke on a previous podcast, and I think this is one you and I have talked about is this conversation I had with Mr. Ed Powers. Awesome dude, incredibly smart. But at the end, we talked about I. Um, I tore down the miracle morning as another one of the, I, I don't know how Elrod, I didn't even finish the book. I got like 40 pages in, but when I realized that the miracle morning was you wake up at 4am and you go for a run and the rest of your day will be great. I was like, what the f <laughs> fuck? Like, <laughs> what if I work the third shift? What if I don't get home until 7am because this, and I'm, obviously that's like a ridiculous example, but the overly prescripted nature of content being delivered to people today. And then the response of some people of like, oh, this worked great for me. If it doesn't work great for you, then you feel like a schmuck is I just I cannot say it enough. I would I would repeat it over and over again for a 60 minute podcast if I had to. That does not reflect on you. It just <laughs> means you're different than what those people prescribed. And you've got to spend the time to figure out what works for you. A hundred percent, Dylan. I think that's best said. I don't think I need to even add anything to that. 
Could have said it better, man. Where can folks connect with you, Jay? So they can reach out to you. <laughs> and you can give them my... <laughs> Wait, can, what am I, your secretary? My, I don't know, man. You can give them my LinkedIn. I, like, I don't want to get into my full name here, but yeah. I got you. Yeah. I got you. I got you. Jay, this has been a ton of fun. Thank you so much for being a part of it. Uh, I enjoyed meeting you, speaking with you at the, the Customer Success Collective Conference. So glad we got to connect again. I really do appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, man. It's, it's been a blast. You've been listening to Lifetime Value, the podcast for customer success professionals. If you like what you've heard, please rate our show and subscribe wherever you find your podcast. Please note that the views expressed in these conversations are attributed only to those individuals on this podcast and do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of their respective employers. For all inquiries, please reach out via email to dylan at lifetimevaluepodcast.com. Find us on YouTube via our channel, Lifetime Value, and find us on the socials at Lifetime Value Podcast. But here we go. English is my second language, by the way, so don't, don't come at me. <laughs> this is Jay, and you're listening to Lifetime Value, the customer success podcast.